Welcome to the second of our debates that we are having here between myself and Dr. John Gerstner. As I mentioned before our first session, these debates are mock debates, so called because the positions that I am expounding in this debate are not my own, but I am trying to act as the devil's advocate and set before Dr. Gerstner some of the uh, uh, classical arguments against Christianity uh, that have been set forth through the ages. And then Dr. Gerstner, in his own inimitable fashion, uh, will respond to them. In our first session, we considered the question of truth and how we can have it. And in this session, Dr. Gerstner, we're going to get down perhaps to the most important single truth of uh, biblical Christianity, and that's the question of the existence of God. I'm aware, as you are, that the Bible begins with the simple statement, in the beginning, God. Uh, there's no attempt at that point to prove the existence of God. It just proclaims, in the beginning, God. And then what's even more astonishing is that the first thing that's said about God is that He creates the heavens and the earth. And I also am aware uh, in the history of civilization that for millennia that people, uh, if I may say unsophisticated people, pre-scientific people to large measure accepted that uh, introductory statement of Genesis uh, as, uh, as the truth of God, uh, perhaps even uncritically. But we live on the other side, this side of what has been called the Enlightenment. And as a historian yourself, you know that modern historians are saying we're living in the post-Christian era, and that the God hypothesis, which served well during the Dark Ages, when there wasn't a grand challenge from science, has now been uh, all but dismissed to uh, a religious sphere of life. And now we seem to have clear evidence <clears throat> that we don't need to appeal to God to account for this universe. Uh, in recent months and over the past year or so, we've seen the vast exploration of space through the Hubble spacecraft, and we're getting more information daily about the origins of this universe that seem to suggest that this universe, thank you very much, came into being without any assistance from some supernatural being that we call God. So in this day and age, why should anybody with any degree of scientific or philosophical sophistication, Dr. Gerstner, still actually want to hold on to this antiquated idea of a, a supernatural being who created the world? Well, the first thing is I'd question the uh, historicity of what you're saying about people today getting more and more information about a universe which wasn't created by God as the old hypothesis entertained. I'd like to hear you tell me one item of new information about the universe which carries with it the knowledge that no God created it. Well, you're certainly familiar, at least uh, I'm a layman when it comes to astrophysics and that sort of thing, but I'm familiar with the Big Bang theory yeah. of creation that on or about 15 billion years ago, give or take a couple of weeks, that there was a, uh, a previous to this time an eternal condensation of all energy and all matter in the universe into one tiny infinitesimal point of singularity, and that uh, that exploded, and that has sent uh, bits and fragments of that explosion, and in the process of an explosion, generating so much energy and heat and so on that it was actually creating, as it was exploding, it was creating new forms of energy and, and new kinds of atoms and all of that that formed the galaxies and the solar systems as we know it. Oh, I mean, that's a perfectly empirical explanation for the uh, uh, universe. And as, as, as my friend Carl Sagan says, why well, is there any need to, uh, to reach outside of the universe when we can see the, the ingredients, the, 
the mix, the stuff of which the universe is made, coming from this point of singularity. First thing you mention is the Big Bang theory, and then you say, associated with that, is the idea that there was an eternity behind that. Now, I know something about the Big Bang theory, as I'm sure everybody listening here does, but I must not have been reading uh, adequately in the scientific journals when I was told that this Big Bang theory somehow proved that the universe has been there from eternity. Uh, did Carl Sagan say a thing like that, for example? Well, the point is, is that everything, not that the universe as we now know it has been here from okay. eternity, but the principle that all of the energy and matter that exist now in dispersion through these vast reaches of the all cosmos, right. that at one point in time, all this right. was all condensed into one point in space. Okay, okay. one point. To one point, and that this, this was there for eternity. Well, now, wait a minute. You see, the one point in time I can follow. But uh, what preceded that one point in time, you suggest is eternity. Now, where did anybody get the message, along with the Big Bang or any other point of origin, that uh, before that was eternity, or that it came out of something which was there from all eternity? All I know is that there are scientists who believe that the universe as we now know it started with a Big Bang, though, as you know, the author himself has retreated from that, but that's beside the point. I have no problem with the idea that there may have been a remote Big Bang that had a good deal to do with the present uh, condition of things. It's, you're saying that a uh, sophisticated modern would realize that with that Big Bang was a demonstration that back of that was an eternity of what? Of matter. Of matter. In that, in that condensed state of singularity. These people can demonstrate that there's an eternal matter? A matter, in, it may be in, an, in the form of energy, but the point is, it's whatever is was there all along. Okay. And all that this did was change the form and the structure. Okay. Then you are saying that there was back of this. Yes. I don't see any demonstration except a declaration that back of this was an eternal matter. Well, Dr. Gerson, that if you want the demonstration, let yeah. me spell it out for you. I was just speaking shorthand because yeah. I would think you were down well, real it estate. Is, it is. Uh, I don't want to be patronizing, but there had to be something to go bang, Dr. Gerstner. Uh -huh. So there had to be something before the big bang uh -huh. for it to go for it to bang. What, uh, what was before, you say, a concentration of energy? A concentration of energy into its, its, its point of singularity. Yeah. Everything that is now dispersed into the universe uh -huh was once concentrated in one uh, exceedingly dense mass. Would anybody say that that something which gave birth to the Big Bang didn't exist a moment before the Big Bang occurred? Well, something had to exist. Something had. That could have happened, could it not, a moment before that, as far as anything science knows? I'm just checking this uh, uh, notion so prevalent today that whatever science says, carries with it a kind of implication of eternity and the non-necessity of deity. And if you're going to make statements like that or challenge me about statements like that, I'd just rather like to know. See, I have no problem with your Big Bang. It doesn't really. I don't know whether it's proven or not proven. It just wouldn't matter to me whether it was or not. But when you suggest, when you make a transition from a Big Bang to eternity and the eternity of matter, I take it there ought to be some sort of demonstration and not a sort of scientific throwing of its weight around. Well, I don't want to just throw weight around, Dr. Gerster, and I, I hear the weight, feel the weight of the objections you're making right. now, and the okay. point is well taken, sir. But my further question is, what's the matter with matter? Okay. Well, why not okay. well, at least postulate All right. an eternal matter? My first point will be this, that you are not proving the eternity of matter. You're just assuming it. 
So you have no right to condescend and sort of look down your academic nose at persons who don't affirm out of hand that matter is well, eternal. Well, excuse me. I, I, I don't want to be condescending in the pejorative sense, Dr. Gerstner, but let me give you my reason for that condescension. That's what I'd like to have. All right. You grant that there is such a thing as matter now. Okay. And no dispute about that. No. Okay. Well, you say, what's the matter with matter? There no, may be about that. I, I no, but I'm just saying that whether okay. there is such a thing as matter. Okay, let's we go. We at least agree that now there's matter. Now there's matter. Now there's matter. Right. We're, we're discussing now is how long it's been here okay. and how it got here. Okay. But and at least we agree that it is here. Yeah, but we don't agree that it's been eternally uh, I know we don't agree with that. Well, we're going to well, 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 set that aside for now. I says, well, what I'm trying to do is find what we do agree with. I mean, can't you find some common ground with a devil? Yeah, I can. <laughs> All right, I that can. That there is matter here. I can even, for the sake of argument, grant you the eternality of matter. All right, but I'm not asking for that right now, okay? At any rate, you... Oh, no, you're condescending to me. <laughs> so we can, we can dispense with the condescension, and let's go to the matter, all okay. right, which is at hand, okay. which is matter. Okay. Now, the matter here that we're talking about, there is no dispute between us that matter exists now. Okay. Right? Okay, it depends on what you say next, but okay. tentatively, okay. Well, I'm just asking for okay. my point. Okay. I mean, do you think I'm setting a trap for you? You make me sound like the devil or something. Uh, yeah, <laughs> devils have been known to do things like <laughs> right. that. Okay. But we have no dispute upon the present reality of matter. Okay. You oh. agree that there is such a thing as matter? Yes, as long as you don't have tie anything with it that I would disagree. There's a matter. You, okay. can, you can see it. You okay. can tie all, all the right. things that we okay. went through Go. with the uh, Proceed. Truth. Okay. Now, we don't agree how long it's been here or how it got here. So it seems like. Well, we if agree. you would be a reasonable devil, we could come to easy agreement, but I don't expect you but, to be a reasonable But at least that, that so far we've disputed that. Okay. All right? Okay. No tricks. No I... tricks. All right? There's nothing up there. Yeah. Now, the question of the existence of God, okay, is in dispute not only for eternity and for yesterday, but for right now. In fact, that's the thing we're discussing, whether there exists now a God. Now, I said, you want to uh, assert the existence of God from all eternity, <laughs> I, and, and, I'm, and I'm saying, why not just project backwards the existence of that which we both agree exists now. Okay, I'm willing to do that. You see the point that I'm making? Yeah, I'm even willing to go along with it. All right. Why not just assume All right. that My matter is the mater, that matter's the mother? All right, matter's the mother, and I'm going ahead with you, but I'm just making the observation that it's a gratuitous assumption at the moment. That's all. So you started out by throwing your scientific knowledge about and indicating the fact that rather fideistic Christians came jump to conclusions and they're not conversant with what's going on in science. I'm just simply saying, being conversant in an amateur way with what is going on in that field, that there is no scientific data coming out indicating that matter is eternal or that God is merely a hypothesis. That's all I'm saying so far. But as far as willing, being willing to go along with you, I'll actually go so far as to say, let's assume. I'm not granting you any cogency in your argument, but I'm perfectly willing to argue with you that this is eternal matter. Okay? All right, now, recognizing it's gratuitous, I now say... Well, wait a minute. The burden of proof's not on me. I said, what's wrong with assuming this? I'm going to I show said, you. But you're, you're telling, I'm, I'm challenging the Christian assumption of the existence of God. I'm saying the burden of proof is on you. I'm taking it. Okay, take I'm it. I'm just observing you haven't proven anything well, yourself. I don't have to. Uh, well, you are saying it, uh, you are talking about eternity and all that sort of thing, and I'm just ever pointing out that it's a gratuitous assumption. What, that there's an eternity? Yes. So That's far, a gratuitous far as science is concerned. I thought, wait a minute, I thought we agreed there before that we both agreed that there had to be something in eternity. 
We hadn't exactly gotten that far. We had just gotten to the great <coughs> Big Bang, and well, you mentioned I, I, Carl Sagan. Me, but I and thought, you're... you know, that I said that that uh, that there had to be something that stretches back to eternity, and you, I thought I heard you say yes. But um, if I misunderstood you, that's fine. That's all right. Go ahead. So we're not making that assumption. Okay. Now, just the only thing I'm gratuitously assuming with you is that matter is eternal. And I'm just reminding you, lest you get a little bit of this scientific arrogance into your spirit, that science has demonstrated that that is so, and it hasn't demonstrated that is so, and you have not shown it is, but I'm willing, for the purposes of debate, to assume what you are more or less affirming, and so on, that matter is eternal. Okay. okay. Yes. Now, the burden of proof is on me. Yes. That there is still a God, even if matter were eternal. Okay. Who is this uh, gentleman, that gentleman right back of you? This man was here. Was perfectly willing to yeah. admit that he couldn't prove that matter was not eternal, but he could prove that God was the author of it. And I think Thomas Aquinas was quite correct when he said so, and I would like to try to prove to Your Excellency the Devil's representative that indeed, even if matter were eternal, we would assume that it's like the matter we know today that shows, for example, intelligence. Now, matter as such is just existing something but we notice that the matter with which we are familiar does exhibit intelligence. Now, would the devil's advocate grant that much? Well, Dr. Gerson, that depends. We use this word, intelligence. Yeah. What do we really mean by it? Well, we mean that it shows that in this particular matter uh, that we're talking about, uh, there is uh, evidence that it acts as if it knows what it's doing. If I, I, I'm very fond of the dandelion seed, which spreads out a little bit of an umbrella to be carried out by the wind to places other than where it originated. Now, that's a very clever little device for accomplishing that purpose, and I'm absolutely sure that that dandelion seed did not think that up. How, but, well, now, how do you know that that... Uh, I, mean, I don't want... I'm glad you're blushing. No, wait, I'm not blushing. I mean, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of uh, Professor Leibniz, who uh, considered the possibility that even the dandelion had at least petite perceptions, uh -huh. some form of lower form, to be sure, of intelligence, right. because it acts in an intentional manner, as you've fine, just suggested. Fine, fine. An intentional manner of acting suggests some kind of intelligence, yes. does it not? But would you or? Uh, uh, Leibniz ever suggest for a moment that that little dandelion seed thought up this mini perceptive ability itself? Is Leibniz not simply saying, and I remind you that Leibniz was a strong theist. I wish he were here today to demonstrate much more cogently than I could ever do that that little pr mini perceptivity. Right, well, Dr. And, Garza, I'll give you your dandelion and the intelligence, okay? Okay, great. Now, now where do we go All right. From well, I'm trying to say, when you injected the idea of this minimal uh, sensitivity of a perceptive character via uh, Leibniz and so on, that that is not native to matter per se. Nevertheless, matter per se, in terms of the dandelion seed or millions of other illustrations which we have in the cosmos, show intelligence which must have come from something other than matter. That's all I'm maintaining with respect to this specific instance, and can you deny it? You cited Leibniz as on my point, um, on my side, as showing that it actually did this, even on a very minimal level, and but Leibniz could easily be. Doesn't that assume that there is some non-material? Factor Good. to intelligence. Fine, fine. Well, I mean, that's what you're actually arguing. Are you granting that? I mean, are you? But, well, but in modern uh, studies, Dr. Gerster indicates that that our thinking and that what we call our mind is simply the result of uh, electrical responses and stimuli in the brain and the n neurons and so on. Can we not reduce intelligence to physical reality? Well, as I say, once you mention there, can we not reduce? Uh, intellectual elements to physical reality and so on. There you are uh, recognizing the difference yourself. 
reduce it to. This is something other than. Here's matter, which in and of itself, by definition, is not a rational entity. But here is an intellectuality associated with it, which therefore could not come, could right. it, from matter itself. So that we can keep our eye on the issue of the existence of God, number one, and number two, because even as trying as hard as I can to be the best devil's advocate that I can be, even I can't make believe that I can conceive of of uh, physical intelligence. So I'll okay. grant that. Let's go on. Okay. All right, now let's, okay. let's now get to God now. With a dandelion and these other sorts of things which show intelligence, a, an indication that they must have come from some source other than matter. We're assuming, remember, as a gratuitous assumption that matter is eternal. But matter always shows, as far as we know it, intelligence which is not native to matter itself. You see what that infers, implies? That statement I've just mentioned, wherever we see matter, and even if it existed eternally, presumably, there would be intelligence in it that is not native to it, and I would ask what would be the source of it? All right, well, this would indicate that, isn't this, Dr. Gerson, would it be fair to summarize what you're saying, that this is the old classical teleological argument, the argument from design? Yeah, fine, as still we as, see, as that ever. We see intelligence, we see the what seems to be purpose, and intentional activity, even Immanuel Kant yeah. acknowledged that he found it very difficult to escape the conclusion that there's an intelligent architect for this universe. All right. I had to meet a theistic devil, by the way. Well, it's we are just because we have intelligence here. Uh -huh. you just remember my boss, my chief executive officer in my domain is also exceedingly intelligent. Yeah, he, so he knows very you know, well, very but unlike you, he doesn't admit he's anything. He's intelligent as, as can be, but he's also exceedingly wicked. That's his major. Okay. And uh, maybe what you're doing here is giving a case for the uh, creation of the world by my boss rather than yours. Because we see intelligence, right. but we also see this intelligence making a lot of mistakes. We see all kinds of evil in this world, which so all it tells us is if there's an intelligent cause, it's one who uh, uh, isn't perfect in his intelligence and the, the kind of being that you want God to be. You are tacitly uh, conceding to me, I think, that there may be an intelligent being back of God, but it could be satanic rather than divine because there is so much evil in the world. Is That's that what I right. understand exactly you to be what saying? I'm saying? Yes, sir. Now, granted, you, I grant you this much: that your boss, the devil, does indeed love that. That's good news to him that there is evil in the world, and he'll promote as much of it as he can. But this is the thing about your boss: he himself is a being who is not eternal. Now, I know you're dedicated to lying, but remember I got witnesses here. The devil is an evil being who came into existence himself. So he couldn't have been the ultimate source of everything. He had to have a source himself. Uh, why? Well, as I say, we, we got it back with matter. You admit matter had to have a source, right? Yes, and, and, and the intelligence all that we've not proven made. is that there had to be an, uh, something prior to matter right. that was intelligent. Right. Well, we haven't proven that it wasn't that, 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 that Satan, my boss, isn't that intelligence. Why couldn't Satan be that intelligent? Satan, here, the thing about Satan is that uh, if you're an orthodox devil now and will admit something only under pressure because I know you can't be trusted on to tell the truth normally, you will admit, will you not, that your boss is a being who came into existence in time, not of his own origination. No, why well, you're going to lie, that? are you? Huh? Why would I admit that? That's the definition of a devil. Look it up That's in the dictionary. That's the definition of the devil by Christians and by theists who believe that, that the devil was created by God. And I'm saying this God that you're talking about sounds very much like my boss if he is the architect for this mess down here that's filled with evil. Why should I attribute it to God or why, why don't I just assume that your God that you're saying is the creator is evil? All we're trying to find here is an intelligent architect who's more intelligent than you are, more intelligent than I am. Hey, maybe his goodness is greater than your goodness, and maybe his wickedness, you know, maybe he's like the proverbial little boy. When he's good, he's very, very good, and when he's bad, he's horrid. 
Here's the thing. When you look at him as the author of matter and look at matter in general, it is geared for the benefit of man, not for the uh, destruction of man. That's a good God who obviously, if he's omnipotent and evil, could get his kicks out of tormenting his creatures. But we can see the universe isn't geared that way. It's meant to benefit the universe. I know you're always thinking, what about the hurricanes and the pestilence and all that type of thing? I'll be willing to take that up if you're willing to go with me that the fundamental nature of the cosmos, and we're talking about this matter that you began discussing with, is fundamentally geared to benefit us. I'll concede that, and I'll tell you what else I'll concede. I'll concede that... Uh that uh, you've demonstrated in this short period of time that there has to be something uh, uh, e eternally intelligent. And, and is the architect of the universe. And good. And that would uh, certainly uh, justify a claim to a creator. Now, there's a lot more to be said about that. And a lot of it that, that, is, that we know about it and, and, and argue about is from the content of the Bible. Well, I'm not saying so to the Bible now. I know you're not. But maybe what we need to do, since our time is up for this session, is to lay the rest of this on the table for a while and look ahead to that time when we can look at the picture of, that, of the trustworthiness of that book that uh, gives so much information that you... Am uh, I allowed to get in a final word before yes, you the bell are. rings? You get one now, final may word. We not, I would rather insist that we can know without any Bible that there is a creator, that he is basically good, that something has gone wrong with the universe we haven't had time to discuss, just from nature, and if he actually revealed himself in this book we're going to talk about, that would make it all the clearer. No more authoritative, but all the clearer. Is, are you willing to go along with that? You bet. <laughs> Thank you, well, Dr. Well, you're a very reasonable uh, devil, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> but not very intelligent. <laughs> but we'll look forward to the next session when we can uh, take up the question of the uh, trustworthiness of the Bible. Okay. Welcome to the second of our debates that we are having here between myself and Dr. John Gerstner. As I mentioned before our first session, these debates